Christ today to study a portion of your words and sing songs of praise to you. We thank you for this country in which we live. We are in trying times, and you are the only answer to all of these trying times, and we need to look to you each and every day and bring these petitions before you to correct the problems of our country. The politicians can't do it, but there are many men. But by your leadership, this country will continue to be a bright and shining place in the world. We pray for all of those in the prayer should spikes need according to your will. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. The protection of every day of our lives. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
number 158.
Remember to pray for those that are on our prayer list. I ask you to continue to pray for Ellie. She's still in the hospital. And uh, also for Brother Rick. It's good to see him here this morning, this morning, by the way. As he continues to heal from his heart surgery. And also for Marty Couch. Started his radiation. And so you be in prayer for Marty. And Brother uh, Jeff Sawyer asked me to add a lady named Sylvia Woods to the prayer list having some health issues. And so you pray for Sylvia Woods. Anybody else we need to add this morning to the prayer list? Yes, Frank is going to have to have some more
And I love John chapter number 11, so much good in this story. And it is within this account of Lazarus that the Lord, two times in the text we read this morning, gives the command, let us go. Let's go. That tells me that there is emphasis on this because he said it two times. Let us go. There is something that the Lord wanted his disciples to be involved in. He wanted them to be there with him in the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Whatever it was that he was going to do when they got there, he wanted them to be involved in it, so he told them, let's go. And I tell you this morning, it's on my heart, the Lord has something that he wants all of us to be involved in. Yeah. For the lost person that might be here this morning, the exhortation is let us go. Where are we going? Let us go to the cross of Calvary where Jesus bled and died and paid the price for our sin. <laughs> let us go to the empty tomb where Jesus came forth from the grave and rose in victory over death. Let us go to Jesus in faith and have your sins all washed away. Let's go. For believers, there is a work to do. If God didn't have something for us to do, He would have saved us and took us right on up to heaven. But He's left us here for a purpose. There is a work to do. There is a harvest coming. There are seeds of the gospel that must be sown. There is a, mus a message of grace and mercy that must be preached. There are souls to rescue and, and, and deliver out of, the, out of the pit of hell. And the Lord says to His church today, let's go. There's a work that we need to do. There's a few things in this text and I'll not be long this morning. I've been preaching longer here lately than I really want to. I'll try to keep it short this morning. There's a message. There's a few things here in our text that reveals to us some things about the Lord that we need to know for the journey. Number one, if you're taking notes, God, the Lord, He doesn't sugarcoat sin for the fearful. I want you to look at the text again in verses 6 through 8. When he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that he saith, uh, he sa saith he to his disciples, listen to this now, let us go into Judea again. Verse 8, his disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Notice something interesting here. He tells them, let us go into Judea again. Lazarus was in the town of Bethany. But Jesus didn't say, let us go to Bethany. He said, let us go into Judea. Now, Bethany was in the region of Judea, uh, but, but the, the region of Judea is prominently and prolifically known for Jerusalem. He didn't say, let's go to Bethany. He said, let's go to the region of Judea. And, uh, and here's the thing. When, when the disciples heard that, when they heard Judea, their mind went straight to the reception that they had just received earlier in the city of Jerusalem. And if he had said, let's go to Bethany, it would have been quite a comfort to them because they had friends in Bethany, but they didn't have any friends in Jerusalem that was just less than two miles away from Bethany. But Jesus says, let's go to Judea. Let me illustrate for you this morning if I can. If you're from Texas, you know that the city of Houston, uh, the city of Houston is one of the most liberal and anti-Christian cities in all of Texas. Yeah. Now, 
If I told you this morning we're going to gather up, load up on the vans, and we're going to go to the Northwest Baptist Church and visit our friends at the Northwest Baptist Church, you wouldn't have any problems with that. We've got friends there. But if I said we're going to load up and go down to Houston, that takes your mind to a whole other different line of thought. Same difference is going on here. The Lord on purpose was reminding them that the work that He has for us to do is not totally amongst friends and people that love us. We live in a sin-cursed world and it's not always a friendly environment. And God doesn't sugarcoat the evil and the sin and the trouble that we face in this world. Can I tell you this morning, God doesn't sugarcoat your sin. The Bible plainly says, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Your upbringing, your raising, your family heritage... Uh, where you came from doesn't make your sin any better in the sight of God than anybody else's sin. It's all sin. God cannot look upon iniquity, the Bible says. Yours or anybody else's. There were sinners in Bethany just like there were in all of the rest of Judea. God is not a respecter of persons. The Bible says He is not a respecter of families, I might add to that, or, or, uh, or cultures, but what God says is sin in one is sin for everybody. Can I remind you this morning, your sin must be answered for. We look back and, and, and account all of the, the things that took place at the crucifixion of Christ and all of those events that surrounded that. And we think about those Jews that cried, crucify Him. And when man would start pointing the finger at them and those Romans that nailed Him to the cross and pierced His side. And we start thinking, man, that was terrible. I don't want to be like them. Let me tell you something. Jesus was nailed to the cross by your sin too. It was your sin and my sin that held him to the cross. And your sin must be answered for. Either it will be answered for by the blood of Jesus Christ or you will answer for it in eternity. God doesn't sugarcoat your sin. God doesn't sugarcoat the penalty of sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That verse includes the, the physical death of the body. Every man that was born of Adam and Eve, which is all of us. All of us are descendants of Adam and Eve. All of those who descended from Adam would pass through death. Whether you're lost or whether you're saved, one of these days you're going to face the grave. God said, by one man, sin entered into the world. Talking about Adam, I believe. And because of that, death is passed upon all. It has to do with that physical death. But I want you to know, it also has to do with that second death. What the Bible calls an eternity in hell. God doesn't sugarcoat the message of hell. God doesn't sugarcoat the reality of a sinner, a lost person spending an eternity in hell. Preachers have sugarcoated it. Christians have tried to sugarcoat it, but God never did. Jesus preached more about hell than anybody in the Bible. I heard a testimony of a man raised in a so-called Baptist church, got married, and they were, him and his wife were at a special meeting at another church one time, and he heard for the first time the message of the reality of an eternity in hell. He said he was raised in a Baptist church and the preacher never once preached about hell. Not one time. 
I don't know about you, but I think it's a shame that anybody be raised in a Baptist church and not hear the truth about heaven and hell. That's right. Didn't get saved until after he was married and after he had left that church because that preacher refused to preach about hell. It's just too deep of a subject. It's just too strong of a subject. I'm telling you something this morning. I love you and I want to I, I want you to have an eternity in heaven and a relationship with God. I'm not here to sugarcoat sin for you this morning. I'm not here to sugarcoat the message of a reality of eternity, whether it's in heaven or whether it's in hell. I'm here to tell you if you die lost in your sin, you will spend an eternity separated from God in the devil's hell. I'm also here to tell you it doesn't have to be that way for you. Y'all help me preach. It don't have to be that way for you. Hell was not designed for you. God didn't create hell for you. It was for the fallen angels. God wants you to be saved. God wants you to be born again. God wants you to trust in Him and be born again. You can be saved this morning if you'll put your trust in Him. God doesn't sugarcoat sin. He doesn't sugarcoat the penalty of sin, and He doesn't sugarcoat the curse of sin that we live in in this world. Our text, He wanted the disciples to be aware of the troublesome road that they were going to be commanded to walk down. We're going into Judea. Uh, that's where Bethany is, no doubt about that, but that's also where we got rejected so harshly the last time. He wanted his disciples to know that they were being asked to walk a road that would not be easy. It, it would take courage and it would take strength. Can I remind you this morning, Christian friends, whatever God is calling you to do, it's not always going to be easy. When God calls a man to the pastorate or to preach or to the pulpit, he knows it's not always easy going to be easy. When God calls you to whatever area of Christian service He might call you to, it's not going to be easy. We might as well wrap our minds around the, the reality right now today that there's going to be troubles and hardships that come our way. Why does He want us to know that? So that we can find our backbone as Christians and start seeking our strength and courage in the Lord. The road's going to be rough and rocky, but let's go, he says. He doesn't sugarcoat sin for the fearful. Number two, the Lord doesn't stop time for the hesitant. In verses 9 through 10, you read it again for yourself, but he starts talking about there's 12 hours in the daylight, and then there's the nighttime, and man stumbles at night, but he can walk pretty good in the daytime. And he and he says all of that about this night and day business to emphasize this point to his disciples. We need to go now. We need to get on the road now. And I want to come I come by to tell you this morning to remind you that God's will for your life and my life is not going to wait. Number one, God's will for your life is not going to wait for the opposition to set down the stones. I look at these disciples in this text, it's almost as if they were trying to convince the Lord, let's just wait until they calm down just a little bit. Let's wait. Do you remember the last time, Lord, they were wanting to stone you? They tried to stone you, but let's just wait until they calm down and set the stones down, and then we'll go back. Can I tell you this morning, if you're waiting to serve the Lord until you can operate in an environment where everybody's happy with you and loves you and loves what you're doing, if that's what you're waiting for, you're never going to get started. Never going to get started. 
There will always be somebody in the family that don't like what you're doing for the Lord. There will always be somebody within your circle of friends at the school that don't like what you're doing for the Lord. There will always be people at your workplace that don't care for what you're trying to do for God. And, and if you're committed to God's will for your life, it's going to take up some of your time and it's going to draw away some of your attention that other people in your life are not willing to give up. God's will. Not going to wait till everybody sets down the stone. God's will is not going to wait for a more comfortable time slot in your schedule and in your calendar. You're waiting for a more convenient season to serve God. You're never going to get started. There will always be another sports game to play. There will always be another activity to be involved in. There will always be more overtime to work at the workplace. There will always be another crisis to have to deal with. There will always be another bill that needs to get paid. In the Bible, the Apostle Paul preached a sermon to a man and where he presented him with the gospel and the message of salvation. And this is how the man replied to Paul, I will hear of thee when I have a convenient season. In other words, I'll think about this when it's more convenient. Can I tell you this morning, friend, if you're lost, and you're waiting to get saved until there's a more convenient time, listen to the preacher this morning. The devil in hell will put more activities. He'll put more stuff in your mind. He'll give you more stuff to do. And one of these days, you're going to slip off into hell and wish that you'd have taken the time, even though it wasn't convenient. All right. God's will... It's not going to wait until you understand everything about God's plan. Verses 11 through 14, it's almost comical. These saints said he, and after that, he saith unto them, My friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he's asleep, he shall do well. If he's just taking a nap, he'll be all right. But then he says in verse 13, Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Can I tell you this morning, if you're waiting to serve the Lord until you completely understand his plan from the beginning to the end, you're never going to get started. Right. While you're wasting time trying to figure out the details and the secret things that belong unto the Lord, God is saying, let's go. Let's go. He'll give you the understanding that you need along the way as you need it, but let's go. I know about you, but I'm glad I didn't have to know all the details when I got saved, aren't you? I didn't have to understand everything to get saved. I just had to understand about my sin and my need and the fact that Jesus died on the cross and rose again to be my Savior. And all I had to understand was putting my trust in Him. But I can tell you, there was the, being saved, being born again changed my life in ways that I never would have understood at that time. God doesn't stop time for the hesitant. <clears throat> Number three, the Lord doesn't surrender His will for the unbelieving. Verse 15 and 16, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with Him. The Lord doesn't surrender His will for the unbelief. Let us go that we may die with Him. That sounds like a noble statement until we realize who it was that was saying it here. 
Oh, down in Thomas. He's the same one that said, I'll not believe until I put my hand in his side and see the nail prints in his hand. I'll not believe in the resurrection. Doubting Thomas, he said, let's just go, let's just go on and go, and we'll just die with him. What I see in Thomas is that he has a cynical approach to God's will. Well, if this is how it's going to be, we might as well just go ahead and die. If God's going to make me be a preacher, then I might as well just die now. If God is going to, if His plan involves me living on limited finances for the rest of my life, then I'd just rather die now. If God is going to make me live with limited mobility, then I just let's just go on and get it over with now. If I'm going to have to live a life separated from the rest of this world, I can't do what everybody else does, and I, I can't look like everybody else does, then I might as well just go on and die now. If I've got to minister to a bunch of lost people that I don't like, might as well just give it up now. Let's just end it now. Isn't that the same cynical attitude that we find in the Old Testament in that preacher named Jonah over there? He said, hey, if this is the way it's got to be, if I've got to watch God be graceful and merciful to the people that I can't stand, then hey, I'll just curl up underneath this gourd and die. Friends, we can have a bad attitude if you want to about God's will, but it's not going to change His plan one bit. He had a skeptical view of God's power. Well, let's just go on and die. Kind of skeptical, don't you think? Kind of negative, don't you think? I mean, obviously there was a uh, there, humanly speaking, there's a possibility because they already stoned him. But hey, he's traveling around with the God of heaven. I mean, Thomas had seen Jesus turn water into wine. He had seen him miraculously feed 5,000 people. Plus women and children. He had seen Jesus heal a man who had been who had been crippled for 30 years by the pool of Bethesda. He had seen Jesus back down the Pharisees who had brought this woman taken in adultery. I mean, they were holding stones too. Why didn't they just go ahead and kill Jesus? He had seen him. Heal a blind man from birth in Jerusalem. He had seen Jesus stand before the Pharisees in Jerusalem and claim to be God Himself in the flesh while they cried blasphemy and Jesus lived to tell about it. But He couldn't muster up one positive thought at this time. Here we go again. We'll just go ahead and die with him right here. Just get it over with. You know what we do sometimes? We look at our circumstances and we start thinking and working our mind in a negative way. We start making negative predictions about what's going to happen. What, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get in a negative state. I'll drive everybody around me crazy with my negative, negativism, and it doesn't change God's plan one bit. Our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. But we get skeptical. What Thomas made here was a strategic gripe to hopefully bring about a change of plans because he didn't believe that God's plan would work. But I like the first part of verse number 17. After all of that griping was over, it says this, Then Jesus came. He said, it went anyway. 
His plan went anyway. The Lord doesn't surrender His will just because you don't have faith in it. <coughs> so let me close this morning. Lost person, if you're here this morning, you're not saved, never been born again, never trusted Christ as your Savior, I want you to know something. God is not going to sugarcoat your sin for you. Now, I'm sure that you would like to think that you are okay with God. I know you would like to think that you've been good enough to be accepted by God. But the Bible says that you are a sinner just like everybody else. You're just as lost as any drunk has ever been. You're just as lost as any murderer has ever been. You're just as lost as any fornicator or thief has ever been. You're lost this morning. You need to know that God's not going to stop time for you. Every day that you put off doing business with God, every day that you put off being saved is less time that you have. And one day will be your last day. One breath will be your last one. You need to trust Christ now and be saved. Amen. Friend, if you're lost, God is not going to surrender His will and His plan for you to be saved. The Bible is, is God's Word and it says that God's Word endures forever. Preacher, what does it say in God's Word? That He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come under repentance. He's not going to change His mind about that. Your cynicism and your skepticism hasn't changed God's will one bit. He wants you to believe and be saved. It's a choice you must make. Will you choose to trust Him today? Believers, God has a plan for your life. We get fearful. What's going to happen to me? What's people going to do to me? We get fearful about God's plan and He doesn't sugarcoat the dangers and the troubles that we face just to suppress our fears. But what He does do is He offers us strength and courage to those who will seek His face. We have not a high priest which, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We hesitate to do what God wants us to do, but it doesn't change the fact that time marches on and the longer we go outside of the will of God, the more opportunities that we're missing to serve God and to bring others to a saving knowledge of Christ. We get cynical and skeptical, but we find out that God hasn't changed the plan. The Great Commission hasn't changed. His command remains the same to the church today as it was when Jesus stood on this earth. Let's go unto all the world and preach the gospel. We're going to have an invitation here in just a minute. Some folks need to be saved. Some Christians need to get some things straight with God. And tell you, if you need to be saved this morning, let's talk about it. Why don't you come and let's talk about, uh, take the Bible and talk about being saved. In church, believers, there's a place. There's a place right up here at the front for you to get on your knees. On this front pew. And uh, it's no magical place and you know how I feel about all of that. But there's a place for you to get on your knees before God and ask Him to give you the courage and the strength that you need to do what He's asked you to do. And by the way, while you're down there, why don't you just thank Him a little bit. Thank you, Lord, just for giving me an opportunity to serve you in the first place. Amen. The time is right to do business with God this morning, so let's go. Let's go as we stand and sing a verse of invitation. 137. In number 137.
but Miss Cheney brought up a good point. It would be good for us to have a special time of prayer. We've got Ellie, we've got, we've got Marty, and we've got Brother Rick here that's still recovering. Let's just have a, have a word of prayer, special time of prayer for those that are sick and, and need to. Yeah, Brother Frank back there too. And so let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We ask, we're thanking you for the time that you've allowed us to come aside in your house. We thank you for your good grace and mercy, the opportunity that you give us to be saved. Lord, we thank you for what you've been doing in our church as of late. Souls that are being saved, those that are being added to the church, we thank you for that. Amen. And Lord, we come in a special way to you this morning, asking you to put your hand of healing upon those that are on our prayer list, those that have asked interest in our prayers, Lord, those that are dealing with illnesses and, and sicknesses in their body that are beyond that are beyond the ability of man to heal. We're asking that you put your hand of healing upon them. Amen. Touch them in a special way. Lord, we're asking you to do for our people what man can't do. Lord, we just, uh, so many times and so many ways we come to you and asking you to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And here we are again one more time asking you to touch our people. Lord, just bless them. Bless the doctors. Bless the family members that tend to them. Give them strength and courage for the hour. Lord, uh, we just ask that you would touch them in a special way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a baptism. Turn to one twenty to 